I'm Jerry Bromenshank of the University of Montana and Bueller Technology. I'm here today to talk to you about a citizen science project we launched last year to tune our acoustic app. I'm a research professor and lead instructor for the University of Montana's online master beekeeping program. I'm also the CEO of Bueller Technology, which is a tech transfer firm affiliated with U of M. In the early 2000s, my team and I discovered that we could tell a lot about honeybee colony health by the sounds that the colonies produce. In addition, we could discern species of honeybee, such as Apis serrana, the Asian honeybee, from Apis mellifera, the European bee. In the U.S., for Apis mellifera, we could also distinguish different races of bees, such as Italians from Carniolians. The African honeybees sound very different from that of any of the European bees. And these differences are distinctive enough that you can clearly see them in the attached sonograms. Recently, smartphone manufacturers have added sufficient data storage and fast enough processes to run our custom artificial intelligence-based acoustic analysis software. Rather than taking 20 to 30 minutes, we now use 30 second colony recordings, which are automatically analyzed in 12 seconds or less. Now this assumes that you're using the name brand modern, that is version eight or later smartphone or tablet. The older phones and tablets are much slower. In 2019, we released a smartphone based recording and analysis app for all, where all data is uploaded to the cloud for storage and computing including the capability for real-time mapping of bee pests and diseases. Currently, we have about 800 backers and testers worldwide who are helping us tune the app. Designed for smartphones, our app can be used for Android or iPhones, tablets, and laptops. Information such as time, date, and GPS location are automatically collected by the app. Hive identifications can be typed in manually or can be captured by using the phone's camera to scan a barcode. Also, some phones and tablets can readily read some forms of RFID tags, although these tend to have very short read ranges. But we are talking to companies about adding readers that could read tags at longer distances. To summarize, a beekeeper using our app uses the phone's internal microphone or an external microphone to record the sounds of undisturbed colonies. We ask the beekeeper to slide the microphone in as close to the center of the cluster as possible so that we primarily get the sounds of the colony and not the, that of the ambient environment around them. Our AI software then performs a scan and an analysis for eight colony health factors. The beekeeper then visually inspects the recorded colony and enters their findings into the app's colony inspection form. When the beekeeper is near a fast wireless hub, the app uploads all recordings, analyses, and inspection results at the click of a button. This combined information is then used by us to tune the app for accuracy. Based on more than a decade of intensive research, we know that the app, when properly tuned, can distinguish at least eight colony condition variables with 86 to 98% accuracy. But that's for the bees from our region, in our research yards, and those of other researchers. And generally that was obtained using higher end digital recordings. However, according to the specs, modern day smartphones should be able to provide similar or comparable recordings. We use these recordings, to the, again, to the determine whether the colony is queen right, has varroa mites, is Africanized, has small high view or foul root, is infected by Nosema serrani, as well as whether the colony is producing any abnormal sounds, sounds that the colony normally wouldn't produce. For each of the factors surveyed, the app gives us a probability that that factor exists ranging from zero to 100%. In theory, the app should be trainable to discriminate even more factors, such as like including chalk room. It all will depend on whether the bees respond to a given stress with changes in sounds that can be calibrated against some measurable factor of that stress. Uh, and again, in our example, perhaps the number of chalk brood mummies. Our initial research conducted 
for the U.S. Army focused on exposures to toxic chemicals and rapid detection. Not only could we detect exposure incidents in a matter of seconds, but we could even discriminate the type of chemical to which the bee colonies had been exposed. We then proceeded to test whether the sound could be used to determine if a laying queen was present, levels of mites, levels of foul brood, and other critical colony factors. Our initial research sorted these factors based on multivariate statistical analyses. The app now uses computer learning and machine intelligence to do the same, but much more rapidly. Our work has revealed colony dialects. These differences are even more pronounced when we compare recordings from North American bees to those from the United Kingdom, New Zealand, and Australia. In other words, app accuracy depends on our ability to tune and calibrate our algorithms based on recordings and hive inspections from different regions. Since the app uses machine learning, the more recordings, analyses, and colony inspection data sets that we obtain, the better the app should perform. In order to accomplish this, we launched the Citizen Science Project in August of 2019. In our first year, we recruited over 500 backers and testers within 30 days. We now have approximately 800 and the numbers are slowly increasing. Our first major revision of the app began July 2020. Our phase one testing was mainly in the United States and Canada with a scattering of testers in Europe, Asia, and Australia. Phase two will focus on adding more Southern Hemisphere beekeepers. Phase two will launch with the release of our most recent app upgrade. Phase three is our extended plan with the objective of enabling any beekeeper anywhere in the world with a smartphone to use the app to assess colony conditions of their own colonies and to add that data reporting to our global maps. Our app is self-contained on the user's phone. However, all the recordings, analyses, and hive inspection data is uploaded to a secure cloud site. Within two weeks of releasing the initial app, we were able to post worldwide maps of user locations and the reported health of their colonies. Admittedly, in 2019, we had to manually map the data. Our current app revision intends to automate this mapping and posting of colony health reports. Our goal is to post daily updates of bee pests and disease conditions, similar to the reporting and mapping of new cases of human COVID-19 that we've all seen in recent months. Based on the first year of our citizen science project, we learned that for the most part, beekeepers appear to be happy while they work since many hum or sing. However, singing or humming while recording a bee colony more or less negates the usefulness of the recordings. For a variety of reasons, many of our users also skipped visual colony inspections. Some cited that they didn't feel qualified to do so, even though the app provides them with guidance and a pictorial atlas. Using our app without uploading the data does nothing to help us improve the app's accuracy. So we really need people to use it, get the analyses and, send, and recordings and the inspections and send them to us. And then we can use that to prioritize the training um, data sets that we use for various regions. Engaging users in meaningful discussions of the app via bulletin board proved to be difficult. People just don't seem to be much into using the bulletin board to discuss what they like and dislike about the app, what they discover. We hope to change that. And one of the things we're trying to do is add a series of training videos to that site. Our users did ask for copies of their inspection reports. We're adding that in the revision and we've added automated mapping. Soon each user will get their own reports by calling in location. The publicly available maps will be by larger regions. Our point is that we don't want someone viewing the posted maps to pinpoint exact locations and beekeepers where there's an outbreak of something like American fowl brood or mite infestation. So just the CDC reports the incidence of uh, new cases on a county-wide basis, we intend to do something much the same. We are making slow but steady progress towards realizing some type of online networking as illustrated here. We encourage others trying to test and improve their own apps, such as Varroa counters, 
or IR imaging to assess colony population size to contact us. Perhaps collectively, we can offer users more options in terms of modern tools for bee management and honeybee colony health, and perhaps more will use them. Finally, before we launched our smartphone app, we had already had almost two decades of research funded by competitively won research contracts from the Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Montana Board of Commerce, and others. Early on, we patented the use of colony acoustic for assessing colony conditions, and we published in peer-reviewed journals. For those wanting to know more about all the different things we do, our 2015 paper published in the online journal Biosensors, Volume 5, Number 4, is entitled Bees as Biosensors, Chemosentryability, Honeybee Monitoring System, and Emergent Sensor Technologies Derived from the Pollinator Syndrome. Our newest challenge will be to tune our app for regional bee dialects and for variations in the sensitivity and the quality of audio cards used by different brands and manufacturers of phones, as well as different phone price points. The question here is whether one needs an iPhone or a high-end Samsung Android phone or some type of Google phone, or whether the, a cheap knockoff would do the same job. We suspect that one's going to have to have a pretty good phone, both for the processor speed and for the quality of the audio recordings, but we can tell that from the recordings we get back because our app tells us what kind of phone the user is using. However, in terms of human speech, the cross-platform success of programs like Siri, Cortana, Google, and Alexa suggests that across various brands of you know, phones and tablets, we should be able to do the same for the songs of bees. So we're optimistic. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at behealthguru at gmail.com. You can get our app or see more information on the things we do on our bulletin board at www.behealth.guru. And if you're truly interested in collaborating with us, you may call me on my cell phone. It's U.S. country 01 state 406-544-9007. I thank you for your participation uh, in this presentation and willingness to, to participate in our overall program. And I intend to take questions and answers via the speaker's panel. It'll occur either later today or sometime this week. So that's a quick overview of what we've done. We're talking about almost 20 years of research, so it's very difficult to put it in 15 minutes. So feel free to get a hold of us if you have any additional questions and we'll be glad to, to respond back. Meantime, I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference and we'll be seeing you later in the week. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jerry Bromchenko of the University of Montana in Bee Alert Technology located in Missoula, Montana. It's been a typical fall day here today Last week, we got a 13 plus inch, 100 year record snowfall and sub-zero temperatures. So we're glad to have a better week this week and I hope your weather is good, which reminds me that you folks are viewing these presentations on a Saturday rather than being outside. So I thank you for being here and I thank Peggy Garns for the invitation to talk to you today. Now give me a moment and I'll pull up my PowerPoint. Okay, well, once again, hello. Beekeepers have been trying to develop tools for monitoring bees without opening the hives for decades. A common example of an early technology was the use of simple mechanical scales that were sold by bee equipment suppliers. The last time I saw any of these being sold was in 1988. The first electronically based monitoring system was introduced by Eddie Woods of the UK. In 1965, Woods had an article in Beecraft about his apodictor for swarm detection. At the time, he felt compelled to address public concerns about radial interference of his device with hearing aids. 
It would take until the mid 1990s for electronic hive scales and bee counters to appear on the scene. One of the first of these were our own sensor equipped smart hives that streamed data from Maryland over the internet to Montana using telephone wires. And this was put into service in 1995. In 2012, Frank Litton held the first colony monitoring workshop in Vermont in conjunction with EAS. EAS gave us a generous two hours for the conference. Six presenters showed up, Frank Litton, Robert Seckham and myself, Wayne Esaias from NASA, Hugh Evans from Arnia, and a research scientist from Spain. Frank gave an overview of the monitoring concept. Robert and I demonstrated our handheld acoustic scanner. Wayne talked about his scale hive and possible use of the bees for environmental and weather monitoring. Hugh had an engineered hive scale and a web-based user interface. And the gentleman from Spain had one of the first in-place citizen science data collecting and sharing projects. Two years later in Missoula, Montana, about 30 presenters showed up for the second international monitoring conference. And in 2018, Frank held the third and he had enough people to fill a full day program. And that occurred in Virginia. As bee-related monitoring technologies continued to progress, by 2019, it was clear to Frank and I that more and more researchers, innovators, and companies were appearing. Some of the original innovators had retired, went out of business, or switched to other pursuits. As at least one innovative team sold their business, they went to work for a new startup. Frank's list of technology teams and firms for 2018 was expanded, and by early 2020, we had an email list of nearly 100 potential conference presenters. Then on March 10, Italy went into COVID lockdown. One day I had 50 speakers lined up, then plummeted as virtually all of the international panelists coming to Montana canceled. But surprisingly, we got an outpouring of disappointment about canceling the conference, and Frank and I decided to switch to a virtual format. Switching wasn't easy. It took a lot of work, not the least of which was the task of convincing presenters to pre-record and submit video presentations. The changeover took much longer than we anticipated, and we needed to test out the whole system. The good news was that the University of Montana told all of its students not to come back after spring break. And in one week, the entire campus switched from face-to-face -to, -face to online courses. That gave me pause, especially when I learned that most other colleges and universities were doing the same thing, and most were using Zoom. Despite my normal pessimistic cup half full skepticism, it more or less worked. Emboldened by a campus that went virtual in a week, Frank and I set out to host the fourth international bee and hive monitoring virtual conference held October 5th through the 9th of this year. And what a conference it was. Now in 2012, we have three countries, Italy, Spain, and the US represented at our first monitoring workshop. In 2020, we had speakers from the US, Canada, several European countries, and Australia, countries as far north as Sweden, Ireland, and the Netherlands, as far east as Latvia, and down under from Australia and New Zealand. At the very last minute, I had participants from India and Nepal asking to be included. Unfortunately, it was too late to include them, but there's always next time. Now, to, now I want you all to be sure to pay particular attention to these maps. I think Frank will come on at the end to give you a quiz about the national maps. One week after the five day virtual monitoring conference, Frank and I talked and we had had some chance to catch up on rest and ponder the outcome. And I fully agree with Frank's assessment. Frank said, the conference came out very well extremely well considering it was a first time last minute thing. 
The fact that it was on Zoom and was a worldwide event made it much more significant than a local event would have been. And it felt like it was a sea change in, a, in the field of bee and colony monitoring technology, or perhaps we should now call it beekeeping technology. The conference also reinforced one of my own personal observations, which I first made about streaming data in 1995. I was comparing what we have been doing to what our smart highs loaded with sensors yielded as they stream data. I compared that to going from the drip of a faucet to the nozzle of a fire hose. Dr. Malcolm San Sanford has been the reporter who has covered all four conferences. He recently quoted me as commenting during the 2020 conference, conference that a dribble of data and interest in monitoring technologies as of 2012 has now, as of 2020, morphed into a full-blown fire hose of relevant information. I don't necessarily remember saying that, but I agree with the statement. For the five-day conference, Frank and I divided the conference into several topic groups and then presented one or two topics per day. You can see the agenda for the first day on your screen. Now, keep in mind, I have provided Peggy Garns with all the abstracts, and you can retrieve all the videos because they're posted to our UM YouTube channel, so you can see them for yourself. Rather than plunge into the 50, 15-minute videos from the first on Monday to the last on Friday, I suggest that you first access the abstracts for the topics of interest to you then decide which videos you most want to watch. Now in this and the next four slides, you'll see a number in gold type to the, less, to the left of the title references. That corresponds to the order in the program that the talk was given and to the abstract that accompanies it. So if you see something of interest, grab a pen or pencil, jot down the ones of most interest, and then go to our YouTube site. Okay, let's look at the week. On Monday, the conference opened with overviews of colony monitoring developments, concluding that the question is not if, but when these innovations will become a mainstay of modern agriculture. Eight technical presentations followed, all focused on single sensor technologies. One uses a smartphone's microphone to detect and diagnose colony health problems. Another group is exploring statistical analyses of colony sounds. Two groups use a smartphone's camera to count varroa mites. Another uses a phone app plus an infrared or IR camera to assess colony size. While a PhD graduate student is imaging heater bee behavior using IR video. For monitoring bee foraging flights, one company employs a camera in front of the hive and another a low cost frequency Doppler sensor mounted above the hive entrance. Now you'll see a few pictures on the left side of these charts. They certainly are not of all 50, but it gives you some idea of the type of technology we're talking about. Tuesday had 13 presentations covering multi-sensor devices, analytics, and how to interpret and use the data. As in previous conferences, some of these companies included electronic high scales. Many used some combination of sensors for temperature and relative humidity, may add a microphone, and a few have added an accelerometer or other unique sensor. One company is considering monitoring honeybees and also profiling pollinator diversity, abundance and richness, and searching for Asian hornets. Absent for 2020 were pictures of bundles of wires, big batteries, and large solar panels and handbelt systems. Real businesses are emerging. Most are building and beginning to explore large databases. The most obvious changes for 2020 to me were smaller, highly engineered sensor units, established citizen science projects, and targeting the needs of commercial beekeepers. Wednesday had two major themes, 
the first took a deeper look into exploring, analyzing, and visualizing monitoring data. The second covered implementations of data-driven bee management programs for research and for beekeepers. The most unique presentation of Wednesday was about research in Australia aimed at developing an electronic nose for sniffing out American fowl brood. Many of us who were speakers were delighted that there is now sufficient data experience and knowledge among the presenters to actually have and be able to talk about real data. The overall theme for the day was leveraging data to make a difference. For those of us who are admittedly science geeks or data science mercenaries, this was a fun day. Thursday again had two themes. The first addressed large geospatial and landscape level studies and issues. The second provided an overview of radio frequency tags from multiple uses, next generation insulated beehives, one of which includes embedded RFIDs, and a summary of a 1500 colony intensity study using professional level infrared imaging cameras to grade colony size. Free bee tracking technologies were introduced. A mechanical drone for locating and mapping drone concentration areas, LIDAR imaging and ranging instruments for high resolution mapping of foraging bees over fields, and long range RFID tags for bees that were used to track bumblebees with an automated act active motion system called RANA and an intelligent image recognition system based on self-organizing maps. This la latter project is intended to move towards the next generation of electronic or e-ecology tools for pollinator surveillance. Friday addressed ongoing research and services ranging from an NSF i survey to help researchers and businesses gain valuable insights into what customers really want and need, to the latest in methods for varroa and disease detection, as well as research and services related to indoor wintering and storage of bee colonies. The capstone of the week was a presentation by Chris and Matt from the executive board of the American Honey Producers Association. This was followed by an informative question and answer session. Chris is the vice president of the American Honey Producers and Matt is on the executive board. These two beekeepers run about 30,000 colonies between California, Washington and North Dakota and between Texas North Dakota and California. Honestly, I'm just beginning to ponder the lessons learned from the week-long conference. I have spent considerable time over the last three weeks editing all 50 abstracts, and I now need to go back and review the video presentations again. Frank is right though, 2020 revealed a sea change in the field of bee and hive monitoring technology not just in the hardware and software, but also among the innovators themselves. Engineered sensor systems are rapidly replacing hand-built prototypes. Citizen science is the new buzzword. A wash in data, the challenge is how to process and interpret it. Several presenters mentioned machine learning and artificial intelligence. But from my perspective, I think only a few of these are actually using these specific tools. More commonly, they're using advanced mathematical analytics. Landscape level analyses that consider factors such as crops, forage, weather, and geospatial statistics are just beginning to emerge. Data standardization is essential for data sharing. Companies compete and must protect their intellectual property and trade secrets. And we need to find ways to share data and collaborate. That was identified as a conference priority. Just as an accurate streaming data high scale is replacing mechanical scales, 
I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that electronic scales will soon be replaced by self weighing highs. Advanced electronic technologies are now, for the first time, being augmented by advanced chemical and biological tools. We, saw, uh, we know of a feedable bacterial phage to control American frog root. There's also, courtesy of the US Army, sophisticated analytical instrument, instrumentation to rapidly and inexpensively find viruses and microbes. And there's promising new research that may lead to an e-nose to uncover foul brood and maybe even mites. The customer base is no longer solely forced, focused, excuse me, the customer base is no longer solely focused on the backyard and small scale beekeepers. Commercial beekeepers who own and manage most of the bee colonies for pollination are vital to agriculture. Professional beekeeping businesses often run thousands or tens of thousands of colonies over multiple states in the US. Our two representatives of the American honey producers have over 30,000 colonies and have bees in North Dakota, Texas, Washington, and California. Moving towards data-driven agricultural practices is an obvious goal. But perhaps we need to take a step back and ask, is the bee industry ready for all this? Do we have solutions to problems or do we have lots of solutions looking for problems? You may find that talking to potential customers yields surprising answers. In summary, this week-long conference showcased what is being done at this moment and possibilities for the future. As Frank, my co-chair, concluded, there is a lot to be digested by anyone trying to synthesize the materials presented in this event. I have a feeling that a lot of people will access these videos for some time to come. I fully agree with Frank. I think that this was a a critical benchmark in the advancement of modern technologies. This is becoming a serious enterprise. We've got businesses, some with rather significant funding behind them. They're starting to engineer their tools for durability, ruggedness, and long battery life. It'll be interesting to see if this upward trend continues to expand or whether it's sort of slowed down by the current pandemic, but whatever, we know things are going to continue to change and evolve. The dairy industry and the cereal crops industry moved to precision agriculture and a variety of high-tech tools years ago. I think that the bee industry is posed on the, ready to, to explore these, but what it will take to get it adopted as regular management practices remain to be seen. But I'll let you make your own decisions. If you go to the link that is shown, you can view all of the videos and I will soon be posting the abstracts. If you have any questions, you can reach me by email on my American online account at bresearch at aol.com. And if you have a pressing question, you can call me at 406-544 9007. Lastly, I have sent the link to the videos to Peggy so that she can distribute it to you. You don't have to copy the one that's on the slideshow. Again, I thank Peggy for the invitation and Jamie for the technical assistance. And I think Jamie's going to switch us to the question and answers. So I'll see you in just a moment. Again, thank you for attending this. Uh, conversation, and I hope to be fielding questions and seeing some of you in just a second. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Dr. Jerry Bromenshank. I'm going to launch a poll, and then we have some questions. Oh, there you are again. Hi, sir. Again, thank you, and we'll switch to the Q&A. That wasn't me. <laughs> that was artificial me. All right, first question. Okay, we have a question. Does, 
Does it provide the level of infestation of the small hybrid of Varroa or et cetera? I assume you're talking about our app and yes, that's the goal. Uh, in our original testing, we could uh, determine with somewhere between 86 and 98% accuracy, both the presence and the levels of um, these pests. All right, here's another one for the app. Does your app ID the pre-swarm sound? No, it doesn't. And when that's, you know, everybody wants that because Eddie Woods did that with the app addictor in 1965. The problem is by the time the colony starts to make the pre-swarm sound, it's too late. And then we have another one about the bee songs. How close are you to offering the app to everyone versus the beta test groups? Well, it's more or less available to everyone at the moment, but uh, if you go to our Bee Health Guru website, that's www.beehealth.guru, uh, you can pay your $20 and get a, a copy of our app. Uh, that We're right on the verge of issuing the next revision of it. The new revision will ask for, will cover some things that people have been asking for. Uh, one of the things that everyone seems to want is to get the records of their own readings from their hives returned back to them. And that is going to be included in the revision. And the second thing is that we want the mapping of what's being reported as problems in bees, whether it's mites or um, small hive beetle, in an automated mapping system that is similar to the daily reports you see from the CDC and COVID spread. We think we've got both of those in hand and right at the moment, we're just waiting for the app stores. They're really slow with this COVID thing to, to post updates, but as soon as those updates are done, uh, we'll have a revision. Now, how soon that will be an accurate uh, app in terms of the acoustics depends on how many people help us and how many people send us back recordings and inspections. Using our app to record something, seeing what it says, and then not inspecting your hive does us absolutely no good in terms of any further development of the, of the app. The problem is, is we can't, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know which phones work really well, which phones don't work at all. We don't know what kinds of, um, factors that are unique to each beekeeper may be affecting the quality of the recordings. What we have learned is we started this a year ago with the idea that people tried to warn them that they shouldn't have generators or the truck motor running while they're trying to record the sounds of the bees inside of the hive and or a plane going over and people were pretty, pretty good about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what we didn't anticipate was that we probably had to invalidate over half of the uh, several of the, of the thousands of recordings that we got back because people were, were talking or more frequently they were singing. So we had the singing beekeeper syndrome. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out whether we can do some type of noise removal for extraneous noises. We've been talking in the conference that we had in October that the last presentation was on, we had some pretty heavy duty companies like SAS, a big statistical firm uh, that were participating. And we're, we've been having some Zoom conferences with them to see if, if they've got any tools that will help us remove those uh, uh, interfering problems such as singing beekeepers and running truck motors. So I guess the clear answer is anyone can get the app now, but it's going to be a year or two before we really get that thing dialed in. And we can only get it dialed in if we get top quality recordings from the users accompanied with an inspection report. Otherwise, we have no idea of which of the analysis are correct and which of them are wrong. Okay, we got another question. Any thoughts on using a Bluetooth or USB microphone? So it can be inserted into the hive with minimal interruption to the potential of getting a better recordings. It well, that's, that's a nice idea. And we have tried it, but Bluetooth is a fickle thing. I have a TV that runs on Bluetooth and I hate it because it, it, it 
prone to interference problems and dropouts, and we need really quality recordings. It also means we would have to add a, um, uh, a processor board inside of the hive that, uh, for communications. While we're in the beta stage to actually get accurate recordings, we prefer, prefer to use a hardwired microphone. Uh, what we do suggest, and I don't, I'm seeing my picture here on the screen. I don't know if you're seeing me or you're seeing that static picture with the uh, question and answer, but uh, uh, if Janie, Jamie could, could turn me on so you can view it, I'll show you what we normally ask people to use for quality recordings. Okay. I'd have to make you the co-host. Yeah. You Is that a problem? Nope. I can do that for you. All right. All right. If you'll share your screen. Well, I just want at the moment for you to, oh, I'm not looking for a sharing. I want my camera. I'm live up in the corner there. How do I get rid of your No, I don't want to stop others. Okay, I don't I don't want to do what this thing does. It wants me to shut down other streamings and so on. Uh, I don't understand why my my live camera, which should be on without streaming, isn't showing. That might be on your end. Does it show uh, up on my side, but it's not. Okay, well, I see myself in the postage stamp up at the top, but I've got your your um, questionnaire splash screen yep. bearing everything. They can see you now. I'm looking at the chat. They can see Jerry. They can see you. You can see me with the green behind me. Yep. Okay. So Thank this you. is what we. This is what I was trying to do. Is we take a small lavalier microphone. Um, you can get these from Amazon for about 60 bucks. The one we like is the, is the Rode R-O-D-E Smart Lab Plus. And that's a tiny but high quality and relatively flat frequency microphone. And if you put a wire or, or somehow feed it through a tube, you get yourself about a 12 inch probe like this. You can just sit, slide that in gently into the hive and let the bees on the bottom board and let the bees settle down. If that gets that probe in underneath the main cluster. The problem we're seeing with the phone that some of you realize is the bees tend to jump on them and you gotta wait for the bees to settle down and ignore the phone before you take a recording. The other issue is because you got bees that are not real happy with the phone there, people are reluctant to, to push the phone very deep into the, into the hive. So they're not getting good recordings. They're really low volume. So, um, you know, I, we don't have a workaround with that yet. Uh, and be quite frankly, I think that, uh, you know, we, that we are talking to some, let me back up. Frankly, we're talking to some of the other companies that I talked about in the conference that we held. And you saw those little center suites that are saddle, like little saddle clips and so on that go over frames. Many of those have a microphone in them. They don't know exactly what to use that microphone for. They're trying to detect swarms, which you'll understand, you, you've heard what I think about the swarm detection. I'm, I'm not real optimistic about that being done soon enough to be of any real use. And they're looking for overall colony activity or population size by overall noise. That's not what we're doing with ours. And they're, they're happy that they got a $2 microphone, but we're, we're going to see if we can't get a couple of them to send us some of their recordings because they do have a Bluetooth in them or a wireless system. And maybe we can piggyback onto their technology, up the game for them and give us more recordings. But uh, that, that's in the conversational stage at the moment. All right, we have one other question for you. Okay. okay. The question is, I have used my phone only and the bees tend to cover the phone up. Would you mm -hmm. say would you suggest a microphone? Well, that's what I'm just talking about. <laughs> okay, yes. 
Yeah, yes, that's what I just said. We do suggest a microphone. Get one of these smart labs, get a piece of wire or something like that and make something like I'm showing you on the screen and you can slide that in and get a much better recording. Okay, one more question. Is there any way that you can have Ohio clubs or beekeepers participate in one of your group studies? Absolutely, we'd lo love to have them. And if, you know, if, if you, uh, you could do it either way, basically, you know, again, go to our Bee Health Guru site and uh, log in. And we do, we hate to be annoying and ask for a $20 donation, but we're doing all, you know, you can get R and D money for this kind of thing, but getting the, the test money that we need to do the test and calibrate the application from the federal agencies is really difficult. It's not, it's not something they foresee. And so at the moment I'm, I'm supposed to be re retired and so on, but we asked for those $20 donation because that pays us to, we have to automatically, we have to manually set up the registration. We have to manually set up your accounts for security reasons. And we're doing that manually because about this time a year ago, we got hacked by the Russians and we spent about three weeks fending off thousands of attempts to, um, to roll in and, and co-opt our website. So there, we have to have some hands and we have to pay for some services and so on. So we asked for a modest donation, but it would be, but Peggy, it would be easier if for me, if you had a group of people in the Ohio club that would like to participate so that we could code them somehow so we know who the Ohio people are. And then I can set them up inside of my uh, Be, Be Health Guru uh, website as a private group. And you guys can all share your experiences and stuff amongst each other, but you don't necessarily need to share it with uh, everybody else in the world. So that'd be great. <laughs> 